to the discussion part of Integrated Clinical Vignettes with Dr. Carla Raj. Last week, we looked at a patient. A patient was the following. Last week, we looked at a 74-year-old male with the following ECG pattern for six weeks, treated prophylactically with the appropriate medication. In order for us to truly understand what's going on with the patient, we have to dissect the ECG pattern. And our discussion as we go through the ECG is going to lay down the foundation, and then we'll then clue you in as to what you need to do next. What does that ECG pattern look like? Here's the ECG for our patient. Hand-drawn, simplistic, but yet achieves all the objectives that we want to uh, discuss. When we take a look at an ECG, what kind of things are you paying attention to? Sinus. Is a sinus rhythm. What does sinus mean to you? A sinoatrial node, SA node, located in the right atrium and uh, gives rise to what wave? Good, the P wave. The problem with our ECG here is the fact that we're not able to identify any distinct P waves, are we? No. The fact that there are no distinct P waves and that there's no correlation between the P and what follows the P wave, well, there should be a little bit of a delay, right? And that's called the PR interval. The PR interval, as you know, is the time that's required for an impulse to be transmitted from the SA node to the AV node. That delay then allows for the blood from the atrium, the last bit, to be kicked into the ventricle for proper filler. And how important is that? Ridiculously important. But none of that is present. What kind of things would you be looking for in the patient, on a chart, in your question? from what, any of the boards. The description that you're looking for is, is this a regular rhythm? Is it a regularly irregular rhythm? Or is it irregularly irregular? What does that all that mean? It just sounds like a bunch of words put together. But understand, please, that each one of those words are particularly placed so that you are able to figure out what's going on with your patient. And by the time you're done reading about your patient, listening to your patient, interpreting the ECG, you come up with the proper management plan. So what are these descriptions? Well, first and foremost, at this point, we've realized that our patient has a problem with the atrium. How do we do that? Because there is no distinct P wave. The curious complexes are present, but understand that they're showing up how. Well, that's the question that you want to ask yourself. What I'm going to do next is uh, draw out these beats in a circular fashion, all being uniformed, or at least attempt to. So the fact that we're seeing here the beats in a patient in which perhaps you're feeling, and maybe you're listening to what have you, is all uniformed in nature, is then described as being regular. And what does regular mean? Regular means that they're normal beats with normal intervals. Fantastic. But, as we said earlier, this ECG does not represent that. In fact, there is absolutely no time between the P wave and the appearing QRS complex. If that time is less than 200 milliseconds, if it's less than 200 milliseconds, that is equivalent to approximately 300 beats per minute. Our patient is deaf in tachycardia. Alright, so that's regular, or the definition of. Let's move on to other descriptions. What if you had a description in which you were reading and it said something about the ECG pattern being irregularly irregular? How can something be regularly irregular? Well, one of the differentials that you should be thinking is, let's say, that you had one beat followed by another beat and perfectly normal. And by that I mean that there was a normal PR interval of it being, let's say, within 0 0.2 seconds or within 200 milliseconds as far as a PR interval. And, uh, well, after that second beat, there was a little bit of a pause. And then another beat then took place. Subsequently, after that beat, there was a longer pause. And the beat showed up. 
And when that beat then showed up, well, subsequently thereafter, there might have been a P wave, but guess what? There was a dropping of that QRS complex. The dropping of that QRS complex, ladies and gentlemen, represents that we have an irregular beat at that juncture. Thereafter, we have our beat then that showed up, and uh, it's back to normal pattern, in which it is now establishing a pause or progressive prolongation of the PR interval. Until finally, there is disappearance in a predictable manner. In a predictable manner. So the fact that we are seeing an irregular beat that is showing up in a predictable manner is then referred to as being regularly irregular. And that is what we have with this patient. Well, when I say this patient, I mean a patient that you are conducting a physical exam in. This is the pattern that you've established. So for this patient, which is not our patient in our discussion, but understand the description regular irregular will be something like, and I'm hoping that many of you already have diagnosed our patient here as being a second degree AB block. And as soon as you're a second degree AB block, understand that there's two types. And this is Mobitz type 1. That Mobitz type 1 is then referred to as Winky Bach. What's the description that we see here? Regularly irregular. All right, let's talk about another regularly irregular, but one in which we're going to apply more pathophysiology, and, and it, this is you're going to find this to be fascinating. So let's talk about a patient who is uh, oh approximately the same age, and this time, however, has fatigue and tiredness, and uh, maybe there was increase in end systolic volume, an older patient, and upon cardiac auscultation, at the level of the second intercostal space on the right side, you hear a systolic murmur between S1 and S2. Between S1 and S2, there's something either that you've listened to on a headphone, or if you're taking a board exam or you're listening to in a stethoscope, in which the pattern is established as being a diamond in between S1 and S2. Lovely are those diamonds, but not so much for the patient. And this is your crescendo, decrescendo type of murmur. So we have an aortic stenosis type, but what in the world, what kind of description would you give this, and why would you even call this a regularly irregular? Well, let's talk about beats that are being established. One, two, three, four. Those four beats are being placed, uniformed, so far so good. After the fourth beat, now before we get into any of that, please understand the underlying pathology that's taking place with our patient, huh? The fact that you have an older patient and have an aortic stenosis, huh, higher differential, should be something like a discrophicalcification taking place of the aortic valve. Normal number of cusps, yet the damaged valves is now accumulating calcium. Dystrophic calcification, as soon as you have calcium depositing on a valve, do you think you're making it easier or more difficult for it to open? Ladies and gentlemen, you're all thinking you're having a hard time opening. Period. So, where does this bring us? It brings us into the physiology realm, doesn't it? Really, the pathophys. What I'm attempting to draw out here is a curve known as a left ventricular pressure curve. That's what that is. We have a second curve here that I'm attempting to draw, and that is going to be aortic pressure curve. Would you please notice that we have a discrepancy between the two pressure curves, don't we? Right here, the peak pressure, or the left ventricular peak pressure, is higher, and the aortic pressure that we see here is uh, a little bit, shall we say, well, not synchronous. We could definitely say they're not synchronous. Normally, please understand, and you should know, that when the left ventricle is about to open up that aortic valve, which occurs at that point right there, cannot do so properly and effectively because of increased afterload due to that dystrophic calcification, resulting, results in an increase in left ventricular peak pressure, and that discrepancy should never exist physiologically. This is a pathology. This is aortic stenosis. Now imagine as to what that's going to sound like on a chest with the patient. 
Well, you're building up a heck of a lot of pressure with each beat, aren't you? One, two, three, four. Finally, let's say that with that increased pressure overload of the left ventricle, we have concentric hypertrophy. Finally, you can then open up the left vent that aortic valve. And when you can, you have a hard beat. A hard beat. Subsequently thereafter, we have four beats. All uniformed, relatively normal, building up pressure. Finally, that fourth, or should we say after that fourth beat, we have a hard, irregular beat. So that irregular beat that's showing up, ladies and gentlemen, once again, is that predictable in this case? Yes, it is. How would you describe this? How about regularly irregular? A second differential for regularly irregular. The one that's clear to you is the Wenckebach. The one that is interesting and pathophysiologically possible clinically. Rare? Sure. But who cares about rare? The fact that you understand what's happening is truly the point, isn't it? Now, what about this murmur? Crescendo, decrescendo. That murmur is going to radiate where? To the carotid. Not the blood, but the murmur is going to then radiate to the carotid because of that increased pressure. That is not what our patient has. Let's move on. So now, let's say that you have a patient in which, as we see here, the QRS complexes, they're appearing irregular, right? But are they in a predictable manner? Absolutely not. Look how close these two QRS complexes are showing up versus the increased length between these two. There's no correlation between the P wave and the QRS complex. How would you then describe this, ladies and gentlemen? Irregularly irregular. What I'm going to do here is give you a little bit of a pause and make sure that you understand everything that I've just described here in its entirety. Once you've understood the descriptions and the path of his, then we can talk a little bit more. I'll tell you one thing right now. With this irregularly irregular type of pattern with this older patient, and I haven't given you much more detail, but I shall subsequently. Maybe there was cardiac disease. And by cardiac disease in a developed country, such as the United States, understand clinically our patient might have hypertensive heart disease or coronary heart disease. And when that occurs, you tell me what your patient is now predisposing or predisposed to develop atrial fibrillation. And once you have that atrial fibrillation, well, what part of that Virchow triad might you be thinking of, uh, of fulfilling the criteria? Virchow triad. We're talking about turbulence. We're talking about development of a thrombi. And when you have development of a thrombi, my goodness gracious, what are you worried about? A thromboembolic episode, aren't you? Where is that emboli moving to? Where am I? Most likely, left atrium. Now it's become a blender in there. You hear it? Or feel it? Not good. At that type of turbulent flow resulting in thrombo formation and embolizing where? Beyond the left ventricle, maybe perhaps into the carotid. If it then goes into carotid, what's my patient look like? A stroke-like patient. If my patient, well, has an embolization taking place in the renal artery, resulting in renal arterial stenosis, or perhaps if it goes into the supramesenteric artery, resulting in ischemic bowel disease. Let's take a break. When we come back, we'll continue with our discussion. And we'll go through the answer choices that was provided to you. And we're going to rule out every single one based on the understanding of the information that has been provided to you. Hope you're having a good night.